A very good evening to you all and welcome to the last session, uh, possibly a difficult session because everyone would like to finish the day in time and be back home or maybe wherever you want to travel. We won't take much time to uh, do our part as far as this session is concerned. Uh, reason for that is rather simple, that uh, we have one speaker less today, uh, Professor Vidya, who was uh, initially uh, was to address all of us and moderate this session, is not going to be here, and therefore it will be only five of us who will be sharing our thoughts on this uh, important theme of uh, industry academia partnership for empowering students with real world learning. Uh, I would uh, like to throw some light on that because I've been given moderator's role, which I'll do, and I'll also set the tone by sharing some of my thoughts on this subject. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the FIKI, also Dr. Rajesh Pankaj and all other authorities for giving all of us this opportunity. Would also like to welcome my co-panelists uh, who are going to be talking to you soon and all of you for this session. Friends, uh, this topic of empowering students with real world learning is, uh, in my opinion, uh, rather simple in terms of understanding the dynamics, but when it comes to implementation, it becomes a very, very challenging thing in my opinion. The reason for that is simple, that most of the models, at least in Indian context, become non-scalable or cannot be scaled up very easily. Our classes are big, our institutions are big, our diversity is high, and with that probably, uh, and other challenges with languages and various other things, the implementation becomes very, very difficult in my opinion. I would also like to say that uh, when we talk about uh, industry academia partnership, I think uh, we should not put the entire entire spectrum of education in one bracket. I would like to say that uh, the dimensions are different when it comes to different disciplines. I come from engineering disciplines. Uh, experts are there from management and other disciplines also here, social sciences. And obviously they will share their thoughts, but I would like to say that when it comes to medical education, if I'm reflecting on entire set of education, I'll say medical ed education, I think has a huge connect when we say the industry institute interaction because without the hospital internships, nothing happens. And in fact, the component of internships is fairly rigorous and also high in terms of number of hours to be put. I think the same can be said to be true for the law programs, which are of the current generation in the sense that five-year degree law programs generally follow that rigor. I'm not necessarily saying that the same was true for the three-year law programs which were offered earlier. Architecture is another program where this happens very, very strongly. Hotel management, even more strongly, probably they spend half of their time in their laboratory called industry itself. Similarly, possibly you can say nursing and various other programs. But since I come from engineering, my uh, reflection is primarily driven by what I've seen in engineering. And please take it with that sort of a context that whatever I'm sharing is going to be very important. Uh, uh, there's one thing I'd like to say because I've been attending some of the sessions from the morning except for the first one because I arrived here late. And uh, I must say that uh, sometimes the industry has not understood us, sometimes we have not understood them very well. And as a result, we face lots and lots of challenges. I'm just reminded when uh, in the previous session I was talking about uh, some aspect, I was reminded that around 14, 15 years back, we were with a one big IT company, no need to name the company. Those companies will fight with us because I was heading a very uh, well-known engineering institution of the country at that time. And those companies will fight with us that I want first slot in your campus to recruit the people, particularly the IC, IT sector people. And if we call one company as number one, the second company will say, hey, I'm not going to come. That was a challenge. Because of that uh, uh, you know, challenge, each one of them tried to improvise their system 
by suggesting to us every time, okay, we will not come to fourth, uh, fourth year, second semester, we will come in fourth year, first semester. Okay, we agreed because the students want placements. Later it becomes third year, second semester because they wanted to grab them first before any other company does. And finally it also came to end of third year, first semester, that is fifth semester. And that is when we met some of those authorities who were running those organizations. And right or wrong, we were also facing a challenge that oversight committee of government where this OBC seats expansion happened at that time. So we were short of spaces, hostels, classrooms, laboratories, teachers. So we ended up suggesting them, hey, can we make this engineering course rather than four year, a three year course? Because you are anyway recruiting them in after third year. And once we rec you recruit them, those big companies recruit them, the students are never ready to come to classes. They are not keen because they know their, their, their future is secure. These are the kind of challenges we faced because industry probably dealt with their own things in their own interest in different way. And obviously we can blame them, they can blame us, but uh, the challenges remain. They were there earlier 15 years back. That's just a classic example. And once we said that we'll make the program three years because it will save our cost, money, everything, time, space, everything, they understood what we are saying. And then they again went back to fourth year, first semester in terms of recruitment. So there are challenges which are there, but uh, when it comes to empowering students, I would possibly like to give 10, 11 possible methods by which we can take the horse to the grass. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. To empower the student, empowerment will come only when you decide that you want to be empowered. No one can inject empowerment in you. They can provide the circumstances, they can provide the facilities, they can provide the mediums, they can facilitate certain things above your normal requirement and make you satisfied with that. And therefore, I can say that our duty as, as, uh, as teachers, as administrators, as vice chancellors is to make sure that best of the possible methods exist. We deliver the excitement to the student. We counsel them, we mentor them, we guide them. But ultimately, it has to be them who has to empower themselves. And, 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 and that is important. And probably, probably in the current context, you can understand that, that why I am I saying that. We belong to a domain called teaching learning. Unfortunately, the portion of teaching is going down and the ratio of learning in teaching learning is going up. Everyone has to be an able learner. Everyone has to be a lifelong learner. Learnability is the one which we should deliver. The teaching has taken less focus because what teacher teaches, delivers as a content in the class traditionally, are generally available at the click of a button in, 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 the, in the web or wherever from the internet you can gather it. Or otherwise, cooked materials are also available, uh, directly useful to your course or whatever, whatever such things may be there. And therefore, learning has to be given importance. And when learning has to be there, I have to learn if I'm a student. As a teacher, I cannot learn uh, on behalf of my students. And therefore, what I'm trying to share to you now is what are those 10, 11 models, according to me, which can work, which can make the students' learning more useful, provided a student wants to learn. Unfortunately, uh, we have all, go on, all gone through that cycle. We know that. I was myself a student. Maybe today I can say that I was a backbencher, but I knew my limits. I knew what is right and what is wrong, to what extent uh, you use your backbench as a backbench. Uh, but uh, uh, today, uh, we still know that the same practices continue. The students sometimes feel pride that I bunked the class, I, I, I fooled the teacher, and I still probably manage to do some X, Y, Z, whatever they want to claim. I think that is the attitude. It is akin to what we call buying a product, paying for it, and then leaving the product in the shop itself. It's something like that. They or their parents pay for their education. They come to the classroom, but they avoid the classroom. And then they lose the money, and they go back without getting the contents which uh, or, or the knowledge which is supposed to be delivered to them. So one thing for sure from my side, empowering will happen by, by within that you decide. Self has to decide that I want to empower myself. Same is the thing for our teacher's autonomy. 
Many of them say we are not autonomous, but if you have to be autonomous, you will have to be seizing the power. Power cannot be given, power is generally taken, uh, and that's what I'm trying to say in terms of empowerment. However, 1011 models which can facilitate their empowerment or learning are something like that. My distinguished colleagues may add something more to it, or maybe they have, they have some models combined together, so the numbers can be 8, or numbers can be 10 or 12, doesn't matter. My first model is uh, uh, in this uh, industry called education. I'm, I'm giving parlance of uh, industry because uh, uh, many people talk about these, and there was a talk about profit and merging with industry and all that, and in any case, we are talking of partnership with industry. Nothing wrong with it. So in this industry, if uh, we are talking of uh, machinery, I think the machines are akin or equivalent to teachers, or teachers are machinery of that, because they drive the whole exercise of, of uh, basically uh, helping the students. So teachers are most important, in my opinion, and everyone knows that and possibly agree with that. So there are many new models which we have created for industrial-related uh, teaching, learning, or industrial-related inputs which are there. One, of course, is professor of practice. Many of you have come to know of that because UGC around six months came back with the direction on that. But let me tell you, this is a very fairly old concept. Some of the very rated institutions were already following it. IITs and some of the uh, top-notch institutions of the country under a AICT framework were using that. And by the way, something like eight, ten months back, even AICT made such rules. I was part of that committee, so I can tell. Uh, rules means a small set of guidelines whereby a lot of industry people can be engaged in a different model in addition to the professor of practice. So that is one. The second thing is we use a lot of industry faculty, even in my current institution where I'm vice chancellor, Marwadi University, it's a young university, we have a lot of industry people as adjunct faculty. So that can also be there. Then we can possibly use the model of joint appointment. I know a lot of industry people have craving to deliver knowledge to the uh, students of current generation. And uh, we can do joint appointments so that they can uh, divide half their time uh, to uh, academic institution and half to industry, something like that. And then there is a very unique model, which I'll describe in the end, and with that I'll close, and that I call it FIIP, Faculty Industry Immersion Program. Someone was talking about that in the pre-lunch session, not exactly with the same name, but they were mentioning that something like that should be done, so I'll explain to you. So this is as far as the teachers with the industrial experience are concerned, uh, a specialized one, we can do it. When it comes to laboratories, the infrastructure, we have started in most of the institutions which I have headed, I have always made it a point that I'll create industry-supported lab, industry-specific labs, industry problem-solving labs, something like that is what we have done. And we generally, when we partner an industry, we say that uh, you can do that either with the software or hardware and maybe some, some amount of mentoring displays, some amount of coaching and some amount of common projects. So laboratories can be created with the support of industry. And why I'm saying that, uh, we see a lot of industries having good equipment, but once the new standard comes, they have to test things with the new standard or manufacture things with the new standard, whereas the old one, which is still in good condition, lying there and not being used, has no meaning. We can use it at least to give a lot of insight to the students that what happens in the industry. Maybe the norm has changed slightly, the specifications has changed slightly, but the process may still remain the same. So we can acquaint them with that, and that is the beauty of this. I generally give target to my institutions on year-on-year -year basis how many industry labs we should give, and fortunately, industry is also very supportive of that. That is very nice. Uh, my dear friends, this was the second point. Uh, I'll be sharing more points. They are not necessarily in any logical order. I'm, I've just uh, jotted them down for description or uh, just uh, sharing it with you. So the third point happens to be the projects, the open-ended problems which are there. Industry should not mind giving a same project to five groups or ten groups, or ten groups can take it even if industry doesn't give it. And uh, ultimately, when industry is given an open problem, 
all 10 can come with their different answers. Maybe some answers are common, but there may be four or five unique answers. Once they amalgamate all those things, they'll possibly get the very best unique answer. And all those 10 groups which have worked on that problem solving of what we call open problem will have a lot to learn. I think that can be a very unique method where you can call it in a way, simple way, crowdsourcing. It's not necessarily crowdsourcing. There's not too much of bulk in that. But those who feel like solving those problems possibly can do it. So project with open-ended problems can be right. Internships, I need not say much. It's a very common practice. Unfortunately, in engineering, it's not followed with the rigor. I'm reminded of my own case when I was uh, uh, an intern in 1980-81. I went to a very reputed company, PSU, of that time. I, uh, I was given a project, and I fortunately... Uh, those those projects were attempted in that particular industry at that time by the seniors who were supposed to guide me, and they were not successful. Uh, I do not know how, uh, how, but I became successful within a week's time, and I got the answer, and the answer was fairly good. The next message to me was by my seniors who were supposed to guide me and use me, within a week, your internship is over. That is number one statement. You'll get the certificate you better uh, disappear. And second thing is, please don't let anyone know that this problem has been solved. They wanted to take the credit. I think that was the kind of approach which was there. Otherwise, I myself could have learned more and I could have possibly done much more. So sometimes we land into some bad elements when it comes to doing. So a lot of industries also get into this business of they take people for industry because, uh, internship because there is a pressure, but they end up uh, making them sit in a classroom, do some classes, and then give them the certificate. These are the kind of things that have happened. I'm just telling you some uh, unique cases. There are good things also. Pardon me if I'm, I'm not able to narrate all of them. But I'm sure my colleague here from Bits Pelani, Dr. Rajiv Tandon, will be talking about the internships much more because uh, Bits Pilani has made a uh, huge uh, impact when it comes to industry-related projects which are there, internships. Then hackathons are a very good way of deep learning. India has become very good and stable ground for hackathons. The students crave to participate and the model has been well understood. And today India is consulting the rest of the world that how to conduct hackathons and how to drive these things. They again are problem solving of society, of industry or government and even problems can be open-ended. Industrial tours and visits, of course, they are very, very low level in terms of those inputs, but still, they were the, they were the places where you get introduced to something, so that's another model. Having people of industry nature or industry expertise in our boards or in our Senate or in our board of studies, or maybe these days we have started creating research bodies called University Research Council and so on and so forth. We can take these people there, and these people can also help us with a lot of inputs, trying to define the correct path and correct applications and correct problems and all that. We also use, in certainly in my institution, generally an expert amongst the panel of selections, uh, selectors would be an industry expert because they can bring a lot of connect and a lot of value. Through that, we can showcase them and they can give us ideas. And possibly, they also hold a lot of PhDs and expertise in their domain because they do some kind of research. And therefore, we bring them on table. And with that, we come to know a lot about industry. Similarly, we can uh, do a lot of talks and expert talks, which all of us do. And uh, it's a regular feature in almost all institutions in the country. But talks on entrepreneurship, talks on innovation, talks on business, various things are happening through industry people. And in this case, when it's entrepreneurship and all that, it can generally be the young people or people who are recently uh, following their ideas of innovation and entrepreneurship. And therefore, we tend to call them. And that, again, excites a lot of young mind. And a lot of young people are taking plunge in that. I've seen many people with uncluttered mind get into this direction, whether they're in first year or second year or third year, and become successful by the time they are in their final year. They already created companies, they are profit making, and they're very confident. And beauty is that they get a lot of help within the campus while they are doing this particular entrepreneurial setup, which is there. Then, of course, uh, I have liked one of the models, which was, uh, this is my 10th model, if I can say so, is the embedded industry and academic institutions. They are intermingled. 
I do not know how many of you had chance to visit that or not. I was quite impressed that PSG Coimbatore, uh, if some of you have been in Coimbatore, they have integrated industries in their campuses itself. As a part of educational setup itself, the in industry is there. So if you can do that kind of an integration, everyone very easily gets a chance to do that. I think it's not easy to do it, but in, in my opinion, that's a good way to do it if we can do it. So you get a uh, more trained manpower, maybe that cost and time savings are there, the learning becomes enhanced, output can be better, various things can happen. So if we can embed or integrate what we call industry and academic institutions in each other, probably that will be something very, very nice which will be there. The other one obviously would be the use of ed tech and MOOCs. Uh, I don't see Raghavji here, he was there for the last session from Coursera. Uh, and uh, uh, or maybe maybe others who are in the same space, they do a lot of industry related courses, particularly micro credentials, which are becoming the flavor of the time. And therefore, you can see that once again, the industry inputs can be given to the students very easily. So these are some 10, 11 methods, my dear friends, through which we can, I'm repeating once again, we can take the horse to the grass. That's something important. We can say, hey, whatever you want, you use it to the best of your abilities and we'll also deliver it and you can do very well. So with that, uh, possibly I'd like to close that uh, uh, here, but I'd like to also uh, say that if I need to train uh, uh, my students uh, for a given industrial, uh, say, setting or requirement or a job or leadership, whatever, I need to have certain set of projections. I need to know which industry needs what and how many numbers and when. What happens is we are always chasing the problems with four year, five year, six year lag. Right now there is a flavor. Last year the admissions were all in CSE, IT and all those AI, etc. these branches. But within no time, two, three months, everyone started laying off people. 20,000 in one big company, 15 in another, 10 in another, and world over, the feeling is uh, of not very good nature in the sense that whether it will be sustainable in terms of such large numbers getting jobs or not. And finally, we found that, uh, uh, that after four years down the line, we may have the same challenge that these people may not be sought after for jobs. So somewhere there has to be some cursory guideline available and therefore, on a FICCI forum, I am requesting FICCI that can there be a lead to get us some insight into what kind of numbers are required for a given industry. So I may decide that I'll do it for metallurgical industry, I may do it for IT, or I may do it for mining, I may do it for any other mechanical or other industry. I think with that, I'd like to say that uh, if those parameters are known, if those efforts are made, possibly we can empower our students with a better or real world learning in the industry. With that, I'll close my part. Friends, we have the next uh, speaker here. That is Dr. Rajiv Tandon, CEO of WILP Bits Palani, a very famous program of Bits Palani, uh, which is uh, known for its impact. Industries love it, students love it, and it has done wonders to the this thing. Many of us have thought we will be able to copy that model or copy and paste that model, whatever you can say. It never happened because they have thought of it in a very original way. They made roots for that, that's, uh, uh, that they can be handled very easily. They have given time and money to that particular effort. So let's hear from Dr. Rajiv Tandon what he has to say. Please welcome Tandon, sir. Thank you.